Well, welcome to Talk About It Tuesdays. I'm Heather. And I'm Morgan. And we work in the Office of Academic Advising. And today's topic for Talk About It Tuesdays is adapting your learning style. Morgan, do you know what your learning style is? My learning style is visual. Um, you know, ever since I can remember, I have been a very visual learner. I love to see things. I love to be able to like recall things based on pictures and graphs and all those types of things. So I'm 100% visual. Heather, what's your learning style? I'm auditory, um, or sometimes it's it, they call it oral. Um, I like to hear things when I'm, um, that's how I learn best is, you'll notice I, I like to read things out loud. Um, I, I do better when I can hear a lecture. Um, I do take notes, so I do kind of combine the visual and the, the auditory together, but I find that I preference the auditory one more, so. Yeah. Let's look at the definition for the definition for learning styles. So it's the prefer preferential way in which the student absorbs, processes, comprehends, and retains information. Individual learning styles depend on cognitive, emotional, and environmental factors, as well as one's prior experience. So in other words, everyone's different, right? Yes. which makes a lot of sense. It's also why it makes it hard when a professor or an instructor is trying to teach to all the different learning styles, right? Absolutely. And I think that's why it's really important to look at that first word preferential. We all have the ability to use the different learning styles that we're talking about here today. You know, I am visual, but I've used the other ones as well. I just had to adapt my learning style, but we talk about preferential in a way that everyone kind of leans towards maybe one or two. Um, that's kind of like their default learning style. And so again, like you're, you may have a professor that doesn't teach to your learning style and that's why it's important to adapt. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're going to give you, depending on what kind of learning style you are, we're going to give you some tips and ways that you can adapt that learning style. But I bet you're all wondering at home, what are the learning styles? Now, there are quite a few depending on what literature that you read or who is talking about them. Today, we're just gonna concentrate on the main three. So those are visual, oral or auditory, and then kinesthetic. So visual learners, you tend to learn by looking at things, by seeing pictures, graphs, um, illustrations. Those are all really important. By seeing the text on the page, that can be really important for you. Auditory learners, you learn best by hearing. So you're going to benefit from discussions by listening to recordings, maybe, or reading things out loud. Um, usually you're the ones who are like, yeah, I love going to lectures because that that's your preference. Uh, visual learners, you may find it a little bit harder to get something out of a lecture. You usually are having to take notes. And then finally, our kinesthetic learners, these are the ones that um, need to be like physically doing something. So, um, and they, they learn best by doing something that's hands on. So for them, a lecture can be really agonizing. They don't, it's hard for them just to sit still for a 50 minute lecture and really feel like they're absorbing the information. So we're gonna give some tips on how they can do that better too. Um, and just by these definitions, students, you might have kind of figured out which one you preference. Like Morgan talked about, we all can use them. It might depend on the situation that you're in, which one you decide to use or which one you preference. But right now for this purpose of today, we're just gonna talk about ones that you're gonna use within your learning environment. Absolutely. Heather, if they're not sure what their learning style is, is there a way that they can find out? There absolutely is, Morgan, good. We can, if, the, if you wanna contact our office and we're gonna give you our contact information at the end of this, we'd be happy to connect you with the learning style inventory that you can better learn which one you are if you're not sure. Um, usually students are not too surprised after they get their results, they're kind of like, okay, that makes sense. The hard part is sometimes if you overlap, you know, if two of yours overlap, or there are some people who can use all three and find that that, you know, that they really do preference all three of them, just depending on what kind of class it is. So yeah, absolutely. Contact our office and we'd be happy to connect you with the learning style inventory. Awesome. So the other hard part is your instructor may not teach to your learning style, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. I've had this happen several times um, because if you think about it, a professor is teaching, you know, anywhere from a handful of students to hundreds of students in a lecture style class. And, you know, every single day, there's no way that they're going to be able to hit every single different type of learning style, especially depending on the subject and the, the ways that they're um, teaching the matter. So it's really important um, to understand where the professor is coming from and to adapt your learning style to the different styles of the professor. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Do you want to start us off with our prompt at the top? I sure can. So we're going to be talking about visual learners first. And again, I'm a visual learner. So our um, student here, her name is Emma, but I pretty much think that I am Emma in this because this describes me 100%. Um, Emma's learning style is visual, but she has a combination of lecture style and discussion based classes. What can Emma do to adapt her learning style? Awesome. So as we go through these, Morgan, you can let us know if there were ones that you tried specifically or things that didn't work for you. So. So in lectures, you want to make sure that you are using whatever visual is provided. Most of the time, at least nowadays, the professor is going to provide some kind of like slides or maybe they write things on the board. Um, they might have lecture notes that they put up. All of those are going to be helpful to you. And if you don't have access to those already, you want to talk to your professor about, you know, can they be provided either before or after the class? Um, Usually right now, professors are providing everything on Blackboard or whatever platform they're using. But if they're not, again, prod them a little bit and ask them if you can have access to those because for a visual learner, that's really important. Did you have access to your lectures? Yeah, I would say about 90% of my classes I did have access. There were a couple that I had to ask for and say, hey, you know, I'm a visual style learner. Is there any way you can provide the slides for me? But um, a vast majority of my professors were pretty flexible in giving me that. What helped me the most is when the professors actually gave me access to the slides before class because I would print them off. Um, I'm a little bit more of a tangible, I guess, learner in that I like to have the paper copy in front of me. So um, you and I is great. They have free printing. So I would print off my slides um, and take them to class in my binder and be able to take physical notes on that. So don't be afraid. Your professors are a little bit more accommodating than you might think. So just ask and they're probably going to help you out with that. Yeah. Well, that gets us into the next one here about taking notes. And so I'm glad you mentioned on paper. There is, there is actually statistical evidence that shows that taking notes on paper is better than trying to take notes on a laptop or, you know, some kind of technology. Um, there's something about the, the physical writing it down that helps it imprint into your memory better than typing it out. So something to think about students. I'm not gonna say you have to take notes on paper, but it, it can benefit you when you're going back and trying to review and remember things that the actual physical act of writing it down is better than typing it. So think about it, maybe try it for your next class if you don't already. Um, the other thing that that allows you to do then is to create your own visuals in your lecture notes. It's really hard if you're trying to type something, you can't then go back and add a drawing to it with a pencil. You can't draw on your laptop or maybe you have a tablet, maybe you can draw on it, but um, it's easier if you're just doing it on paper to then go back and draw if you want to do a timeline or you want to draw a little cartoon or a graphic or something that's some visual that's going to help you remember that this is something important or some way that you're going to be able to go back and look at it and explain to yourself, you know, maybe the visual will help you to remember why um, your professor brought it up or what it had to do with other things in your notes. Did you ever use anything like that, Morgan? Yeah, I was just going to say this was especially helpful in my math classes, my history classes, and my economics courses, um, because I started out taking notes on my laptop and then I realized like I can't draw a graph on my computer. So it was really difficult for me to, you know, look at supply and demand and figure out how the graph was supposed to go without being able to see a physical copy of it. So what I started doing was just taking notes and um, drawing the pictures and then, you know, if I needed to upload them to Google Docs, I could. Um, but no, I loved being able to take the paper notes, especially in some of those um, classes where you do have graphs and things like that. It was very, very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So then the next thing is paying attention to visual cues from your instructor. So Morgan, what kind of visual cues could a professor give? 
Um, yeah, one of the things that I started to notice with my professors is when they like switch to a really important topic or have something that they want to emphasize is that their face will light up a little bit because, you know, as a professor, it's probably something that they're passionate about. And if it's something that's really important, they're going to get excited to teach you about that. So make sure you're looking at, you know, the visual um, facial expressions of your professors and also any, you know, hand movements, gestures, things like that. Like I talk with my hands, but when I get really, really excited, you know, we're talking about visual learners, I'm excited here. You see, I'm talking with my hands. Um, they may also shift if they're sitting down, if they're moving into a new topic, their body language might shift a little bit. Um, and then of course, switching slides, things like that will let you know, like we're moving into something else, um, especially on slides. If you see bolded text, underlined text, things like that, you're going to know that those are important things, maybe things that you want to pay extra attention to or write down. Um, those are some of the major visual cues from the instructors that I've had. Heather, do you have any to add? I love what you're talking about. Um, I think students sometimes get caught up, especially our visual students about, I have to try and write down every single thing that the professor says or that's on the slide or, and that's really not what we want you to do. We don't want you to try and capture every single word. We want you to get the gist of what they're saying, you know, summarize it for yourself and you're in a way that you, it's going to be meaningful to you. But if you're trying to copy down every single word that the professor is saying or every single word that's on the slide, you're not really engaging in the information. You're just at that point, you're like a, a secretary or something like that, you know? So you really wanna be thinking about why are they telling me this information? How does it, what's the context of it? How does it relate to other things that I read in my material or that we've talked about in other classes that we brought up in discussion? Um, so not trying to copy down word for word, just trying to get main points. And again, if you're seeing visuals on slides, bolded words, uh, underlined words, highlighted things, Things that the professor seems to bring up multiple times are probably things that you should be writing down and paying attention to more so than, you know, the little filler words and things like that. So, and I think as a visual learner, you know, trying to, if they have like a definition on the board or something that's very text heavy, that can be a little overwhelming as a visual learner because I like to try to recall things, you know, if I'm in the middle of a test, what did that look like on my piece of paper? So being able to write it in your own words is going to help you connect that information better um, to something that you're going to understand. And then, you know, when you are in a test or in a project or working on something, you'll be able to, you know, visualize what you had written on your paper in your own words and use that. Yeah. So I have on here, highlighters can be your friend. And I definitely think that's true. I think, again, visual learners tend to over highlight sometimes. Yeah. Um, if you're highlighting everything, then nothing is important. It's all, it's all just yellow now or pink or whatever color you're using. You wanna, you wanna be very um, precise when you're highlighting things. Highlight things that you wanna remember, but that in, there's no other way for you to maybe recall it or to point it out to yourself. Again, if you're highlighting everything, you're going to look at a page of yellow text and you're not, you're not going to remember what was important or why you highlighted that information. So, um, so use it, but use it, you know, uh, precisely or with purpose, I guess. Um, then we get into studying. So when studying, it's really important to preview your text before you go into just reading it. And this is something that I think students make a mistake with every time. They think I'm just gonna open the book and dive into reading it. But Morgan, visual learners really need to pay attention to like the headings. They should go through the chapter first and just pay attention to, okay, where, what, what's the summary say? What are the headings? What are the questions that are at the end of the chapter? Because that's giving your mind a map of how to go. And for visual learners, that map can be really important. Did you ever do this when you were a student? Yeah, so this is something I actually just learned recently um, within my grad program. And it's something that I really, really wish I would have known as a student because I was the kind of person that would open up a textbook and say, let's crack into it. Let's read this text. And, and I would, consistently not really know where the information was going because I didn't have that roadmap. I didn't know, you know, the main points. I wasn't reading the headings. Um, so within the past year and a half, I've really started to read the first paragraph, but then also go back and read the ending right away, just so that I can see where my um, destination is so that I can connect all the information back to what that destination is and make sure that I'm comprehending the information, not just reading, just to read. So students take advantage of this advice. I promise it's going to help you so 
much as you're reading your textbooks. Yeah, I mean, your mind has to have, we talked about a roadmap, but you have to think about it as you're hanging information on, you know, like a coat rack or a hat rack or something, you know, and if you don't have anything to hang it on, the information is just going to slide right down and it mm -hmm. goes right to the bottom and you're not going to be able to recover it or you're digging through a pile of things to try and find it right so you have to you have to give yourself like that thing that you're going to hang stuff on so if you don't go through and kind of preview text first or go back and look at your notes and review the information you haven't given yourself that that thing to hang all the other knowledge on so exactly yeah there were times when i would read a paragraph six, seven times because I couldn't comprehend what it was saying just because I didn't know how to connect it back to the main topic. Oh my gosh. Yes. That I still have that problem sometimes where I'm just reading the same sentence over and over again. And then finally it dawns on me, like, I'm not really getting this. I'm not really paying attention to what I'm reading. And it's the most frustrating thing. <laughs> For sure. Um, no, Morgan, do you take notes when you study? I take notes all the time. Notes are my best friend. I have notebooks upon notebooks, binders upon binders, just completely filled with organized notes. It's the best way that I learn. Absolutely. I mean, for visual learners, taking notes is probably one of the best things that you can do. Because again, you can draw on them, you can doodle in them, you can put timelines and Venn diagrams and all kinds of things that, um, in your notes to help you remember things or to point things out or help explain things. Um, Again, highlighting with purpose, you can highlight your notes, you can highlight things in your book, but just making sure that you understand why am I highlighting this? And then maybe you are writing a little note to yourself, like, you know, call, I'm highlighting this because I want to remember that this is connected to this in a certain way, something like that. So, um, and then creating your own visuals, not just in your notes, but Morgan, did you ever like have classes where you had to create something for yourself so that you would remember not within your notes but some other visual aid to help you with something yeah absolutely i took quite a few history classes and the thing that worked best for me was to make a timeline not necessarily in my notes because then it would kind of get jumbled up with everything else but having a separate piece of paper where you know if i'm taking a history class on american history and i know we're working from 1776 until the 1950s being able to continuously use that same timeline timeline throughout the entire semester and just add to it was really helpful to me because then I could connect to what we learned about three weeks ago um, by looking at that timeline to what we were learning about today. Um, so timelines were really helpful for me. Um, I still use infographics now. Um, I am not an artistic person whatsoever. So I think it's crazy that I'm a visual learner, but I've really learned to use, um, you know, Canva and different programs on the computer to make some infographics. Um, and I'll print those out and put them next to my notes just so that I have a little bit more of a visual versus just 100% text. Um, again, I'm not crafty at all, but cartoons have helped me too. Just little stick people um, has been something that I've used before too. Good. You no one's judging you on how good it looks. It's just to help you remember things or to help you draw attention to things. So exactly. That's and, awesome. and that's what I wanted to say about notes is that I think there's this common misconception that like I'm taking notes. So I have to have a piece of notebook paper. I have to have a heading at the top. I have to have bullet point one, sub bullet point, sub bullet point. But the way that you take notes kind of needs to be your own style. Like that's not going to work for everyone. And so while that may have worked for me in class, when I was studying take notes and do like note cards, like flashcards. And that really helped for me. So students, I don't want you to think that there's only one way of taking notes and that's the one right way. Explore different options and see what works best for you. Um, because it may be a whole page of notes. It may be something quick, like a note card. It could be sticky notes. It could be a million different things. Um, but the purpose is to just have something down so that you can visualize it and recall that for when you're taking your tests. Yes. And so that you can review it multiple times. I don't know why we have in our minds that cramming things in at the last minute is going to help us actually remember it or, you know, use it in a future scenario. It, it's not. Cramming doesn't do anything but cram the information in and then you forget it. I mean, we really do forget most of the information that we put in our minds. So, in order to remember it, you got to go back to it multiple times. You got to use it in different ways. So the more you see it for visual learners, the more you see it, the better you'll remember it. So that's why having a note system that works well for you is really important. So trial and error, find the things that, that work, 
use those. And if it doesn't work, then try something different. Don't, don't discount it just because it didn't work that one time, you know, figure out how you can tweak it. So it does work for you or try something different. So, so that you can go back and review your notes multiple times. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about auditory learners. Other, this one is all you. Okay. So Bailey's learning styles auditory. And they have some asynchronous online classes. What can Bailey do to adapt their learning style? So I love this one because I think right now with all the different kinds of classes or different platforms that you could have your class on, um, I get a lot of students who will say, you know, I feel like I can't get anything out of what's happening because I don't really have, I'm not in the classroom, you know, it's happening at different times. Sometimes I'm just going back and looking at a lecture and that's okay. Even if you're, no matter what your learning style is, you can, you can adapt to all of those different kinds of, of platforms for classes. If you're auditory specifically, you want to prepare to listen to the lecture or the discussion. And that means you don't want to have any distractions. So if you're in class, it's a little bit easier to get rid of the distractions because you're going to be sitting in class. If you've got your laptop open and you're doing other things, that's not so great. Um, but if you're going to be online and looking at a lecture that happened earlier or participating in a Zoom discussion, it's really hard to tune out at those things. So again, getting rid of the distraction, um, maybe you go someplace to listen to the lecture that doesn't have, you know, where your friends aren't, doesn't have um, TV going on or radio blaring or anything like that. Because for auditory learners, like for me, it's really hard if I have to focus on something, if there's other things going around. My mind just cannot do all of the things at one time. So I really have to um, go to a location that allows me to think and listen and give all of my focus and attention to that one thing. Absolutely. And Heather, do auditory learners do well with having, you know, music in the background when they study, possibly a TV show on in the background? Or as an auditory learner, do you need complete silence? So I think that depends. Um, for me, I like I do like to have a little bit of music on in the background, but it can only be music. I can't like if I have a TV show on the background, it's hard for me to focus on what I'm trying to do. Sometimes and if I'm typing things, I end up typing things I hear on the TV subconsciously. I'm not even paying attention. Then I go back and I'm like, oh, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> so um, so I think I think it depends. I do know some auditory learners who need complete silence and mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, I know others that do need something going on like I do. I need something in the background. It just it has to be specific something. It can't be, again, a TV show. I tried listening to audiobooks. That doesn't work. I need kind of like just very mellow music um, just so that it's not complete silence. I think the silence is almost more distracting than having noise. So um, the other thing that you want to do if you're an auditory learner is pay attention to cues from your professor, but you're going to want to pay attention to the verbal ones. So if they get really excited and their voice goes up high, you know, like I always thought I had a professor who had a really low voice, but if he got really excited, suddenly he squeaked. It was so funny, <laughs> but you would know that what he was talking about was really important to him and you, and you might want to pay attention because he could find something about it on a paper that he would have you write or on an exam that he would have you take. So, so raising a voice, um, looking for emotion behind the voice. Uh, if they, you know, if they're talking about something that's sad or something that's really happy, their emotion might change. Um, listening if they slow down on something, you know, or if they try to enunciate something, really, you know, that those are more cues that, hey, this might be important. Professors don't usually try to enunciate something if they don't really care about it, you know? So if they're taking the time to really make sure that you're hearing every single word for emphasis, those are things you wanna pay attention to. So it's the same thing that you're gonna be looking for if you're a visual learner, it's just coming from the, the auditory instead of from what you're seeing, it's what are you hearing from the professor. And another thing that you'll also want to listen to is for, you know, repeats or things that they may say multiple times, whether that's back to back, you know, make sure you know this for the test, make sure you know this for the test, or if they say it several times throughout the class period, that's something that you'll say, he mentioned that like three or four times, that's probably something that I should remember. Yep. 
And then the other thing for auditory learners is participating in class discussion and answering questions out loud. Um, and I know like I'm also an introvert. So it was, it's really hard for me to uh, want to actually say something in class. On the other hand, I know that I will learn better if I can discuss it with someone, if I can have a conversation about it. So whether you're able to do that in class or you're just really, maybe you perk up when it's class discussion because you're like listening to all the different angles and the sides of everything. And then maybe you can take that away and do your own discussion with a classmate later on or discuss it with somebody who wasn't even in the class, you know, teach somebody else what you learned about my son, my, I have a seven-year-old and he comes home from class every day and he's like, mom, let me tell you what I learned. And I love to hear it because I know that he's processing that and he's, he's telling me things and how he sees them. And then I get to ask him questions and see how much he really understands. Or um, like last night I heard the most like ridiculous story about this witch and pasta coming out of a pot and stuff and it was crazy but again he's processing he's telling me and he, it's helping him to understand things better as well so do that with somebody if you're an auditory learner absolutely and I think it's hard for some of our students right now especially with those asynchronous classes where they may just have recorded lectures and they're thinking how can I get this to be discussion-based the nice thing about asynchronous lectures is that you have the ability to pause the lectures and like think about what the professor is saying without the professor just going into the next topic and you not having the time to comprehend that. So I really encourage you to take some time, pause what they're saying. If they're asking a rhetorical question, pause the video anyways and answer the question out loud. Like your roommate may look at you and be like, what are you doing? But you know, you could have a conversation with your roommate about it, um, but really take some time and talk through it. Even if you're not talking to someone directly because you'll be able to hear yourself talk and then you'll be able to remember that a little bit better too. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings us to when you're studying then, I do this all the time, I read things out loud. I do it in my office. Sometimes I'm pacing while I do it and people walk by and they're like, what the heck is she doing? You know, but, but for me, again, if I can hear it, if I can hear myself saying it, or I can hear somebody else saying it, it helps make it, it makes more sense to me. It helps me process it better. So if that works for you, then do it. I mean, you know, they don't know that you're not talking to somebody on your little earpiece or whatever, you know, and who cares? I mean, at this point, everybody's crazy and thinks everybody else is crazy too. We've all, we've all seen, right. You can see my mask collection. We've all seen each other's homes by this point. So, you know, do what works for you. Um, again, we talked about teaching someone else. Um, I do think that that's a really good way to find out what you know and do that before the test, you know, before you're going to take a big exam or something, try to teach somebody else about what you've learned in that particular section, that chapter, that those couple weeks, because then it's going to help you see where the holes are. What do you need to go back and review more? What didn't they understand? How could have you explained it better? If you have to give an essay, if you have like short answer questions or an essay test coming up, Figuring out how you explain something to somebody else by talking through things will help you better on the essay test as well. And then studying with others. Within reason, um, I know sometimes studying with others can be a distraction as well. So you want to pay attention to how you're doing that. But certainly if you're an auditory learner, being able to study with others and discuss with others um, can help you to remember and understand the information better. Exactly. And I think that's where this whole lack of discussion can really come in. So again, with asynchronous classes, you may not be able to have conversations with classmates, but if you find two or three that are in your class that want to have some sort of study group, that can really help bring in that discussion component that you might feel like you're missing from asynchronous online classes right now. Yeah, absolutely. And then review several times. Hey, the more you hear the information, the more you remember it. So maybe you're reading your notes out loud. That's fine. Because again, the, the, the more that you can hear it yourself, say it or somebody else say it, um, the more you're going to go back and remember that. And that's that's the whole point. We want you to remember the things that you're actually reading, that you're hearing. So, exactly. All right. Let's talk about this last one, which is kinesthetic. Yes, and our lovely example here is his name is Troy and he's a kinesthetic learner. So Troy has a combination or excuse me, Troy's learning style is kinesthetic and he has a combination of lecture style and online classes. What can he do to adapt his learning style? Yeah, awesome. So 
I feel like this is probably quite a few of our students. Yes. Um, I usually have a lot of my students will come in and say like, I can't just sit there and listen to lecture. It's so boring, you know, or you can tell sometimes the ones that this, that they are in the class because they're the ones who are kind of like fidgety, you know, like they're okay. trying to listen, but they've also got something else going on. You know, that's how that fidget spinner got started was to give, you know, students in K through 12 who are, who just can't sit there, something to sit, you know, to, to fiddle with as they're trying to listen. So um, but in lectures, doing things that keep you active. So the act of taking notes, while great for visual, can also be great for kinesthetic because it's helping them to do something active. Um, again, the drawing of visuals within is keeping you active. Um, I think for kinesthetic learners, it's really important to find concrete examples of things because so much of what we talk about in lectures is abstract. And so the more that you can make it concrete for yourself, and that doesn't mean that the professor is going to make it concrete for you. That means that you're going to take that abstract idea and think about it outside of class and figure out what's a concrete example I could give myself of this particular idea or this thing. Um, that can be really helpful if you can come up with those kinds of things. For sure. I always struggle with this. Kinesthetic is my second, you know, my, the second learning style that I fall back on. I mean, I'm even fidgeting with a pen right now because I have to. Um, but I definitely struggle with the abstract ideas and being able to relate it back. Um, and this is something that you've taught me before is that, you know, as children, when we learn, we see an object and then we learn what the name is. So we see an apple and then we learn the word apple and that's how we connect that thought. But in college it's reversed and so we learn a word and then it's kind of our job as students to figure out what that word means in a concrete example and like you said a professor is not going to have the time to do that so what's helped me is to like write down those words maybe leave class with an unclear definition but then take some time afterwards to reflect connect that back to a memory or connect it to something physical that I can touch, something that I can hold, because that's really gonna help me when I go into that test setting saying, okay, we were talking about supply and demand. So I held three apples in this hand um, so that I can kind of figure out what that supply and what that demand looks like so that I have a concrete example. So yeah, awesome. Ah, I'm so happy I taught you something. <laughs> yes, I know, I was like, ah, Heather, she taught me this, I better say it. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so for kinesthetic learners, you will also pay attention to cues. Your cues are probably going to be more of the nonverbals. Morgan talked a little bit about those. So like the movement of your professor might be really important. Again, if they get really close, if they're standing really far away from the class, they're probably not as excited about the topic that they're talking about. But if they suddenly leave the podium or they step off the stage or they get just physically closer to the students in the classroom, they're probably getting excited about whatever it is that they're talking about. If they start, as Morgan brought up before, using gestures, you know, talking with their hands like this, you know, and, and then that's probably also followed by voice inflection, change in emotion, all that kind of stuff. Um, those are things you want to pay attention to. Um, the nonverbal cues for a kinesthetic learner are probably easier to pick up on and, and maybe more important because um, you may not be catching the auditory ones or the visual ones necessarily. So look for the nonverbal ones. Anything you want to say about that, Morgan? I think the other thing is that if a professor is like pacing back and forth, it probably means that it's something a little bit more important. I've had so many professors that will sit up at the front of the room and just look at their computers until it's time to start talking about something really intense. And then they'll stand up and they may move closer. Um, I've also had professors that stand in the back of the room. And then when important topics come up, they're going to come more towards the front so the entire class can see them. Um, so that's something else that you can look for too. Yeah. So for kinesthetic learners, being able to participate in class discussion is probably like a major, major yes. They definitely want to do this. Um, in fact, they probably get really excited about class discussions more so than maybe the introvert in me does. So, um, and those are kind of the ones that we lean on in class to actually like carry the class discussion, those kinesthetic learners. 
Um, but if you're not paying attention to what was happening in the lecture or you're not doing the reading ahead of time, you're not going to have as good of a class discussion or something to contribute that's as meaningful. So it is important to do your research ahead of time to be up on the reading so that you can really participate and get something out of that discussion. My kinesthetic learners who come in and talk about, um, you know, I didn't get anything we discussed and it was just like it was boring. I didn't get anything out of it probably didn't come into it feeling as prepared as as they could have. And so they couldn't contribute and they couldn't lead the class in a in a way that was meaningful for them. So so just think about that. Um, good to participate, but you have to have something that's worthy of saying that leads the class in a direction. So exactly. And I think that also goes with, you know, a professor saying, I need a volunteer. Like, it's great if you want to volunteer, but make sure you understand the concepts before you get up there in front of the class and they're asking you questions or asking you to, to solve a problem that you're not familiar with. Right. Yep. Um, when you're studying, again, the moving around can, can be good. So if you're doing some reading and you're reading while you're walking around, uh, that's good. Or I don't know, I know some people can, can run and read or, you know, do the elliptical and read, you know, that might be, that might really help you. Um, one tip that I was reading about was using your hands to count specific points. So you could say, you know, like point one, point two, point three. Then when you're on the test and, you know, you could actually do in, at your test, you could in your mind going, you know, like just the act of doing it will help you. Um, it's creating a memory. It's helping you remember things when you get on the test then. Um, acting things out. I love this one. Um, you know, we have a lot of students who, you know, need that movement, but like if you're in a history class or if you're in an English class, I, I used to do this when I was reading things, I'd have to kind of like, okay, let's act out this scene so that I can remember it better for when I get to the test or so that I can write about it better when I have to in my essay. Um, that can be really helpful. The taking notes and, and then finding concrete examples for the things that you're studying will be really important. And Morgan, you already talked about um, how you'd have to go back and kind of reflect on that mm -hmm. later on. Yeah, Sometimes, I mean, it's so important. Go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it's so important, especially, you know, in these upper level college classes where you're learning brand new things that, you know, is very specialized to your field that you may have no context behind. It is really important to take that time after class to reflect I can't tell you the amount of words that I've read in a book or heard in class that, you know, I'm like, oh, I know what that is. And then somebody asks me what it is. And I'm like, I honestly have no idea the definition because it was just words that went in ear went out the other. So I really had to connect it to a memory or an experience or something. Mm -hmm. um, experiment with things. So, and this is not just for science classes. I mean, there's, there are way you, you can do experiments with math. You can do experiments with humanities. I mean, um, I think the point is just like the, the trial and error of things, you know, so try something. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Try something different, you know, but then reflect on why didn't it work? Is there a different way I could have done it that would have been better? Um, for kinesthetic learners, you really will benefit from smaller chunks of time studying with breaks in between, because again, you're going to get kind of uh, fidgety if you're trying to study for like hours and hours and hours. So give yourself a light at the tunnel. You know, I'm going to study for 30 minutes this particular, I'm going to get this chapter done or this topic, give yourself a break and then go back and, and continue studying. Or maybe it's an hour, hour and a half, something like that. But don't be trying to study for four hours at one time that's too much. That might even be too much for anybody, but definitely for kinesthetic learners, way too much. So. And if you're having a problem with figuring out how to study and how to break up your time, we did just do a talk about it Tuesday on um, the trouble with time management. So make sure you check that out. We have some really fun tips on, you know, study um, schedules and how you can make one that works out best for you. Yep. Good plug. And Thanks. then, uh, <laughs> Um, teaching someone else for kinesthetic learners, that's a great thing to do as well. Um, study groups, again, if you can do them with um, intention and not just to be social, 
um, study groups can be great. If you're in a class that's online and you don't really interact with many of your classmates, ask the professor to send an email out to the class saying, you know, so and so is going to start a study group. If you're interested in joining, here's the link or, you know, here's where they're meeting at, times, things like that. I mean, I think professors are willing to do that. If your class has access to Blackboard, um, you can definitely um, send your own email because that just goes out to the students who are in your class. So invite people who are interested to come to a study group with you um, if you don't know how else to contact them. So. Exactly. And then again, review the information, even for kinesthetic learners, this is important. The more you use the information, the more you'll remember. So for auditory, it's hearing it. For visual, it's seeing it. And for kinesthetic, it's using the information. That's what's going to help you remember it the best. One thing that I want to point out um, is that we're talking about learning styles. And so it's important to learn the information, not just remember the information. And I think in college, especially, it's so easy for us to say, I have a test next week. I'm going to learn the information for the test and then I'm never going to use it again and I'm going to forget it. Um, but in college level classes, you're often in a major where, you know, the class that you're taking now, the information is going to be built upon next semester and in subsequent semesters after that. So when you're reviewing this information, it's important to not only, you know, store it in your memory just for a test or for a project or a paper, um, but really learn the information so that you have a concrete foundation for when you have to build upon that um, to be able to, you know, take your higher level classes and get your degree in that way. Ah, oh, I love it because you just led us into our general tips, Morgan. This is perfect. So you'll see, so I've got some things about memory on here. My first general tip would be just go to class in whatever form it's offered. Like Morgan was just talking about, you actually have to input the information in order to pull it back out. So if you're not going to class, if you're not doing the reading, there's nothing to remember. There's nothing to pull out. Um, I know the, the students who think like, well, if I don't go to class, I'll do fine on the test anyways, because all I have to do is read the information. But class is where you actually get to provide context to what you're reading about and where you get to hear the cues and see the cues and you know practice the information. So going to class is really important. Going prepared is really important as well. So do the reading. Um, you know, do the research that whatever the professor is asking you to do beforehand so that you can really participate and pro provide context when you're in the class. Exactly. Paying attention to the cues your instructor gives you, whether they're verbal, nonverbal, um, things that you hear, visual, all of that's important. This, I'm sure you've heard this, Morgan, I feel like I'm teaching myself, right? Yeah, this was me when I first came into college, because in high school, they kind of hold your hand, you know, they they lead you through the information. If you're not getting it, they're going to take that extra time with you and they're going to make sure they're hitting on all the different learning styles. College is so, so, so different. And in my first semester, I felt like I was teaching myself a lot because I didn't know how to take things away from the lecture. I was so overwhelmed by trying to write everything down, trying to absorb everything that I couldn't remember anything. So yeah, you may feel like you're teaching yourself, but it's also up to you to decide what you wanna pull out from each lecture or pull out from each reading that's important, um, that's going to lead you to success in your tests and projects and things like that. Yes, exactly. I think the other thing that students, so usually they'll say, I feel like I'm teaching myself. And then I, you know, I follow it up with, well, how else is it supposed to work? So your instructor provides you information and expertise but your instructor is not in charge of you actually learning the information. You're in charge of you learning the information. You decide if you actually are going to pay attention or not. So um, I think that that's a hard lesson for students to learn in, the, in these first couple semesters. Um, they come in, like you were talking about, with this idea that the instructor is going to really hold my hand and give me all the answers. They're going to give you information. They're going to give you their expertise, but you have to find out how it works. You have to use the information. So um, memorizing. So this is just keep this in your mind, students. Memorizing is short term and it's a small gain. You don't get very much out of just memorizing information for a test. Learning is long term and big gain. So you decide what you need. Maybe not every class do you need to learn the information, 
but it sure is helpful <laughs> later on if you did learn the information, whether it's for a major class or for another liberal arts core class. Um, half the things that I learned in my liberal arts core, I found that I used later on in my major and I wasn't, I had no idea that, that was going to happen. But anytime that you can take something that you learned from a different class and use it in one of your major classes, that's connecting things. That's going to help you have a better, not only um, experience within the class, but it's going to help you once you graduate and you're in that career setting. How do I interact with different people who have all of these different viewpoints? You know, you're going to have mathematicians, you're going to have people from English, you're going to have people from history, people from athletics and education and all that. And we all have to be able to listen to each other and taking these different courses is helping you figure out how do I talk to a mathematician? How do I talk to somebody whose main, you know, context of the world is coming from a literature standpoint, you know? So exactly. And I, I think oftentimes our students think it's a liberal arts core class. I'm not going to remember everything. So it's just not that important. And I think it's more about kind of what you were talking about, the skills that come from the class versus, you know, sometimes the actual context. So thinking to my psychology class, do I remember all the parts of the brain? No. But when I was learning about the parts of the brain, did I figure out how to chart things and map things and write things down so that I can use visuals later on in my life? I still carry that to me with to this day. Um, similarly in speech class, do I remember the speeches that I, that I gave, you know, seven years ago? Not so much, but I remember how to put together a really great speech. So even if you're thinking students like, wow, I'm never going to need to know this term. It may be important to think about the ways in which you're learning it, because those are skills that you'll use in your future classes and into your careers too. Yeah. Awesome point. Um, I, again, I really do believe that learning styles can adapt to any class, to teaching style and to any class format, but you do have to do the work on that. Again, it's not going to be up to your professor to do that for you. You have to do it and you have to try different things to know what's going to work and what doesn't. One of the most frustrating things for me is when a student comes in and says, you know, like, oh, nothing's going right. And then I'm like, well, what have you tried? And they're like, nothing. Well, then, yeah, probably nothing is going to work if you're not doing anything. So and then the final thing is different classes are going to require different strategies, no matter what your learning style is. So um, figuring out how to adapt is really important. The technique of learning how to adapt your learning style is something that you're going to be able to use also in your future. Just that the process of how did I adapt to this is going to help you when you need to adapt to something else, some other challenge, another issue, breaking down a barrier, whatever it is. So yeah, good stuff, Morgan. I know, I love it. We are getting to our wrap up here. So this is our contact information. You've got mine, you've got Morgan's. We put our peer advisor email up there if you want to email them. Um, always encourage you to reach out to your friends and classmates and ask them about, you know, how are you doing these things and um, taking tips from them. Reach out to your professors, you know, if you if you have a professor that you feel like you're not meshing well with their teaching style, reach out and say, you know, this is something I think might help me based on what my learning style is, you know, could you adapt for me. Um, you'd be surprised at, at sometimes there are really simple fixes that a professor can do if they know that you need them. So exactly. make sure you're reaching out to anybody in your circle. We'll talk about circles later on in another talk about it Tuesday, but just make sure that, you know, you're utilizing your network. It doesn't always have to come from, um, you know, someone in a, you know, professional position like Heather and I, you can talk to your friends, you can talk to your roommate, talk to your parents um, or guardians or anyone that you're close to because they're going to have a wealth of knowledge and they may know you um, and be able to give you some, you know, direct information on that too. Um, just kind of looking ahead. Um, if you're watching this before January 5th, you are welcome to join us live for our next Talk About It Tuesday. Um, it's at noon. It will use the same Zoom link as this one. Um, obviously, you're watching it pre-recorded. So if you're past the January 5th deadline, um, we will have that one recorded as well and uploaded into the same place. So um, we only have three left after this. Um, in this series, we may continue on and see how the semester goes, but definitely make sure that you join us for navigating online and other types of classes. Woohoo! Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you at the next one. See ya.